I want very much to welcome you to the 2016 Jones Day Experian with Court Competition. I want to start by thanking our sponsors, the law firm Jones Day and Experian. They have been the sponsors of our moot court program since the very beginning. So please join me in thanking them for their generous support for this program. <laughs> the moot court competition is truly a central feature of the law school. It's something I'm very proud of. It is an entirely student-run organization. So would you also take a moment and thank all of the members of the Moot Court Board who wrote the record, designed the problem, ran the competition, and every other aspect of this. <laughs> I will simply at this point introduce who the three judges will be. Um, to your far left, or to the right hand of the stage, will be Judge Morgan Christen. She is a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. After a distinguished career as a lawyer, she was on the Alaska Supreme Court. President Obama nominated her successfully for the Ninth Circuit. In the middle of the panel will be Judge Jennifer Elrod from the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Again, a very distinguished career as a lawyer and as a state court judge. And George W. Bush nominated her successfully for the Fifth Circuit. And at the far end of the panel, on th this end, will be Judge Patricia Millette, um, United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. She had a long career in the United States Solicitor General's Office, where she argued many cases before the United States Supreme Court. She was then an attorney in private practice before President Obama put her onto the D.C. Circuit. So it is truly a distinguished panel. I'm very grateful to them. And I'll say it again when they're here for giving their time to travel to Southern California to be part of this moot court experience. Thank all of you for coming, and it's time now to have the round. Please rise. Hear ye, hear ye, the Honorable Justices, Kristen, Elrod, and Millette presiding. Thank you. You may be seated. We have one argument for the day. You may proceed. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Brett Long for petitioner. With the permission of the court, I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Okay. You may have it. Thank you. Your Honors, Wisconsin's Act 23 is an attack on the most precious fundamental right possessed by the American people, the right to vote. Citing theoretical and remote interests, Act 23 removes the ability to vote from a large portion of the Wisconsin population. It's a violation of the 14th Amendment and of Section 2 of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. I'd like to start with the 14th Amendment. And this court has established a flexible standard called the Anderson Verdict Test for determining- Why are we starting with the Constitution? If you win under the Voting Rights Act, do we need to decide the constitutional question? Uh, no, Your Honor. Don't we normally try to avoid constitutional questions and decide statutory questions first if we can? If you, I, I can begin with the Voting Rights Act, if you'd like. Act 23 violates Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act because it imposes a burden on minority voters in Wisconsin, <coughs> namely the black and Latino population of Wisconsin, that disproportionately diminishes these populations' ability to participate in the process. What the, evidence in the record supports that? Well, there's a two-part framework that's been used, and so for the first part of that framework, which is looking for a disparate impact, 
the defendants conceded at trial that these population, uh, the black population and the Latino population, are disproportionately less likely to have an ID than their white counterparts. Uh, by the defense's own expert at trial, it was two times more likely. Um, for petitioners, uh, plaintiff's experts at trial, it was between 1.7 and 2.6 times more likely for these individuals to not have an ID. And this is caused by these populations' likelihood of living in poverty. People but the in circuit co court found, counsel, that that doesn't really matter, that despite all of the findings that, that, the, that Wisconsin was only responsible for its, basically, its own discrimination. And, and, the, and the, the, the district court didn't make that finding, right? The, the district court did not make that finding, but if you, if you look at the Senate factors which have been used to decide uh, by the circuit courts to decide vote denial cases, one of those Senate factors, Senate Factor 5 in particular, does not require official discrimination. But Senate Factor 1 does, and neither the district court nor the circuit court looked at the Senate factors. Yes, but the circuit courts in, in other instances, in the 4th, 5th, fifth, and 6th circuits have looked, and we believe they'd be helpful here, because the, when looking at the Senate factors, the Senate specifically left off the word official discrimination from Senate Factor 5, while it included it in Senate Factor 1, showing that it knew what it was doing when it decided that for Senate Factor 5, making individuals bear the burden of discrimination in employment, housing, and in education, they left that word out. I've caused you to jump ahead. Can you, could you back up for me and explain why you think we ought to apply the Senate factors, or, or if you do? Well, I believe they're relevant to the conclusion, to, to drawing a conclusion in this matter. They, they were developed through vote dilution cases, but if you look carefully at them, they seem relevant to the issues and have been applied by lower circuit courts in the 4th, 5th, and 6th circuits. Particularly Senate Factor 5 and Senate Factor 9 are helpful here. Senate Factor 5, as I've uh, mentioned, is forcing these populations to bear the burden of past discrimination as it applies to education, uh, housing. So just to be clear, you think that's the test we should apply rather than the Husted test from the Sixth Circuit? This is the test I believe we should apply, but it's a two-part framework. So what I'm discussing now is simply the, the first section. Well, the first section was whether uh, this disproportionate impact even exists, and that, as I said, was uh, stated at trial. The second part is whether that impact is related to past discrimination. And here, those statistics are, are overwhelming and similar to what was accepted by the court in VC in the Fifth Circuit. Individuals, employment discrimination, for instance, uh, black, in, black people looking for employment in Wisconsin are twice as likely to not receive a callback as their white counterparts. And that edge maintains it, that maintains that its edge even. public or private employment? This is private employment. Should it, should it matter for purposes of these factors since the whole inquiry here is whether a state uh, can undertake action? And if the state isn't actually responsible for the discrimination, then why should it factor into our analysis? Well, no, one, no one's asking the state to remedy or rectify the past discrimination, which is what the, this court held in Milliken. A state can only have to rectify its own discrimination. But here it's asking the state not to play on this discrimination as it exists. And from the perspective of the individual what do you that's mean play on discrimination? Well, the discrimination, Your Honor, in this, in this sense leads to a, a higher likelihood of these populations living, living in poverty. And that is directly connected to a less likely chance of these individuals having ID because people in poverty likely don't drive, don't travel internationally, and so they don't have the types of IDs that are accepted under Act 23. Are so there findings that the, the people at issue cannot get IDs in this case? Yes, absolutely. There it, is a factual finding that they cannot get an ID. There were eight individuals who testified at trial, and that's a very important distinction. Well, they testified that seven of them, anyway, testified they didn't have the birth certificates, and that's why they couldn't get IDs. That they couldn't get IDs, yes. And some, some of them, was not. it was not just that they couldn't get their birth certificates. For some individuals, it was that they did not have them. And this is one of the main problems with this law, is that people born before, say, 1940, 1950, were more likely to be born in rural populations. And if you're born in a rural population, not at a hospital, you don't get a birth certificate. And so two individuals on our record testified that they do not have a birth certificate. So even with Emergency Rule 14, which was instituted after the factual findings of this case, these individuals would not be able to have their information verified. But as whether a certain individuals had a difficulty, how is, how is that determinative of the Voting Rights Act claim? that certain few individuals had personal difficulties. How is that dispositive as to the law's viability? Because the law doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a denial, but it can be an abridgment as well. And by having these populations more likely to not have an ID that imposes a, another step that their white counterparts do not have to partake in in order for them to vote. And, and 
The other way that poverty plays into this is that it's more difficult for someone who is in poverty to then get an ID because of the cost associated with doing so. Why is the burden excessive, counsel? I don't think you really mean to be say that to, to be trying to convince us that it was imp impossible for people to get IDs. I don't I don't really think that's your argument, and I don't hear you to be making it. But but I think you are arguing that this burden is undue, is, is that it's too much. Why why is it? Well, for certain individuals, it, it closes in on impossible for these people based on their situation. But it's helpful to look at why it's so excessive in by juxtaposing this case with Crawford, where it was this court found that it was. Uh, that law was constitutional, and there's some important distinctions. One, there, were no f there was no factual finding in Crawford of any individual who was not going to be able to vote as a result of the Indiana voter law. And that was cited extensively by Justice Stevens in his plurality opinion, that he had wished that something like that was there because it would have allowed him to then uh, quantify the burden, but it wasn't. So if, what, it's how many, if one is, is one enough to, in to require invalidation? Well, or does it have to be seven or eight? What is the number at which we have to invalidate based upon one person's difficulty? Well, that's never been decided by this court what number it would be, but the number of people who are affected, at least in this case, we know to be 300,000, which is vastly superior to the number that was in Crawford, which was estimated to be around 43,000. So when you take into account that Wisconsin's voting population is actually smaller than Indiana, it actually changes it to 1% of Indiana did not have an ID, 9% of Wisconsin does not have an but ID. But it's not whether or not they have an ID, it's whether or not they can't get one, right? Ex yes, Your Honor. And we don't know that 300,000 can't get one. Well, we do know that the eight individuals that testified at trial were having trouble with that and that they could be seen as representative of the whole as we can't bring every individual from Wisconsin into the courtroom. So well, these are- Why shouldn't we examine the racial disparate impacts of Act 23 after controlling for income disparities? Well, if, if that data was available, that could be, that could be used. But- Because you're talking about poverty, not race, aren't you? It, both, both, in, both are tied together in this situation. So the individual, it, it has a racial component because of the ties to poverty and because of past discrimination that makes those racial groups more likely to live in poverty. So it's difficult to separate the two in this case. I'm a little surprised that you agreed that the test is whether they can't get one as opposed to the burdens that are imposed in trying to get one. I think for a poll tax as an example, we don't, it didn't really matter whether someone could have paid the buck 50 poll tax, it's that you shouldn't have that burden standing between you and your vote. If, if I agreed that it was that it had to be impossible, I did not mean to say that. I meant to say that for some it is. Uh, mm -hmm. It is nearing that level, but that is not the, the level, especially for the constitutional argument mm -hmm. of where this should be. And for voting, the Voting Rights Act, it's simply an abridgment that can have right. to. So for purposes of what this, this question of how many sort of translates into the constitutional question here, because you've brought a facial challenge, um, which imposes a very heavy burden on you. And why isn't the right answer that facially, this is fine under Crawford, but if there are some people who really can't get an ID, they could bring an as applied challenge. Well, un under Crawford, I'm not sure Crawford goes far enough to say that a, a voter ID law would be fine. Crawford stands for the proposition that this court applied the Anderson verdict test to those facts and that record. And this case is very different. I understand, in but if we thought under Crawford and the Anderson verdict, or whichever test we chose to apply, um, that this was okay as a facial matter, then could we do that and say whether if there's someone who really can't get an ID, who really loses their right to vote, they can bring an as applied challenge? I think for the right to vote, leaving, leaving that to, to the individual to then defend their right to vote seems, seems to not be sufficient. As, as opposed that's what happens anytime a law is passed. Someone has to bring a lawsuit if they want to have the right to vote. That's but, just how it happens. But this court has the opportunity to not put those individuals into that position. The day before Act 23 was passed, these individuals could vote. They could simply walk to their, to their voting place and vote. And now they have a burden put in between them and that right that is unconstitutional based on the Anderson verdict analysis. That it's not justified because the state's interests in this case are remote and theoretical. Well, normally to bring a facial challenge to invalidate a statute facially, you have to show that it could not constitutionally be applied under any circumstances. Um, can you meet that test here? Since, as you said, 91% of the population that's perfectly constitutional is applied to. But this, this court has found that we can apply it to a subgroup of individuals. So here this subgroup is the 300,000 registered voters who do not have a voter ID. And for those individuals, it cannot be applied constitutionally because they have this burden that is not justified based on the 
interest put forward. But we've already said that's not a substantial burden. In Crawford, would we have to disavow that those are holding in Crawford? Absolutely not, Your Honor. We said the inconvenience of making a trip to the DMV, gathering the required documents, and posing for a photograph surely does not qualify as a substantial burden on the right to vote. The, the plurality opinion in Crawford had three separate groups and two groups of, of um, agreeing with each other. That was Justice Stevens and Justice Scalia. And Justice Stevens lamented the fact that there was not enough information on the burden as it applied to the 43,000 individuals in that case to make a determination and therefore it was not sufficient to overcome the interest. That problem doesn't exist here. And so with the new information brought forward, Justice Stevens could likely feel different when we show that there are 300,000 people affected and eight individuals who testified as opposed to the 43,000 individuals and no people who testified. So if we require an IDE to get into the federal courthouse for security reasons post 9-11, is that unconstitutional too, abridging people's right of access to the courts? Well, that could be challenged, but it certainly doesn't rise to the level of a right to vote, which is more fundamental than any right that this court could put forward. So when looking into that- It's more fundamental than, are we certain that's more fundamental than the right to a public trial? The right to vote is preservative of all other rights and without the right to vote, those other rights can go out the window. So this court has repeatedly stated that of the fundamental rights, the right to vote is the most precious. And so the, you're making a distinction here. IDs can be required for everything else. Judge, judging on the interest put forward for, for, the reason, for the reasoning, there you put forward the reasoning of security, which mm -hmm. could very well be much more substantial than the reasons put forth in this case of preventing voter fraud, which has not been shown to exist in the state of Wisconsin. Well, and it's, what if they said they were worried about terrorists disrupting elections, so they want IDs for that reason? Well, those aren't the interests that are put forward. I know, but I'm just, this is a hypothetical. So if they, if, they, if they added to their list of reasons, we also want to increase security um, and deter somebody from walking into a voting place with a with a bomb on them, let's, let's show IDs. So they require an ID before walking into the precinct. That would fall under a, the similar problem of a remote and theoretical interest, which this court has specifically said cannot be the basis. Why is it any more remote there than the courthouse? Well, nothing, not, the remote and theoretical interest does not apply to something like the courthouse. It applies to specifically the right to vote. And so while remote interests or theoretical interests may work for prohibiting someone from entering a courthouse, they would not work here because this court has specifically said they cannot be the basis for abridging the right to vote. Why do you keep calling this a remote and theoretical interest? Shouldn't we accept as a legislative fact that photo IDs promote confidence in the electoral system? Well, the legislature found that based on the readings of the Carter-Baker report, but they conveniently did not read the part of the Carter-Baker report which said that the voter ID laws could increase confidence if they're rolled out in the correct way. And there were some very important caveats they put on that, such as having a two election, uh, two election cycle where it, you would allow individuals to vote with simply a signature, where they would have mobile offices pop up in communities to help individuals get these IDs, public outreach, contacting people that they know are registered but do not have, a, do not have an ID. These types of things were not put in the Carter-Baker report to, to be ignored, they were, they were but the legislature had the report and they made the determination. Aren't they much more institutionally competent to make these determinations than we are? Well, You're asking us to say that it doesn't help public confidence, aren't you? I'm asking you to agree with the trial court, which had a trial and found from the experts there that voter ID laws not only have zero correlation, as was also confirmed by the Harvard Law Review that was placed in the trial court argument, but that they can actually decrease public confidence. And that was testified but, but to- But counsel, I think the point is, if I could just forgive me for interrupting for a minute, but I think you're skipping over an important point, which is I understand there was a two week trial and a lot of findings of fact, but the Seventh Circuit found that the, the district court wasn't free to make that fact because there was a, this legislative findings. So, so what about that? Can I, can I come answer your question off the stop time? Yes. Okay. Um, this court has a chance just to rule that it does not, uh, finding the voter ID laws do not necessarily, no matter what shape or form they take, promote voter confidence. To do so, it sets a dangerous precedent because it allows the state to attach public confidence to any voter ID law, no matter how restrictive or how difficult it becomes to get. So, so you understand my question is, was the district court free to make this finding, given the legislative fact? Whether, I, I suppose they were, they, they did, and, and you are now deal, dealing with that aftermath. You've saved time for rebuttal. Yes. Thank you. 
Madam Chief Justice and your honors, may it please the court. Counsel, what's a legislative fact? I'm sorry, your honor? What's a legislative fact? A legislative fact is, um, I believe, any, any fact that the legislature in their wisdom after um, hearings, um, reports, testimony, um, et cetera, uh, deem, deemed to be true. The Seventh and Circuit thought in this case that the district court wasn't free to make this finding about the, uh, the second interest asserted by the state. What's your position on that? Your Honor, um, this court in 2000 recognized in Nixon that particularly in the area of um, legislative, or sorry, in the area of elections, legislatures are the appropriate expertise or expert. They have the institutional expertise in, in this area. Under our system of federalism, of separation of powers, states are entitled to be laboratories. So how does that work if there's a finding, if there, let's just assume that there is sure, a legislative sure. finding that, that, that this type of voter ID is going to increase public confidence in the electoral process. Is yes. that established then for all time? Is there no way for a district court to take findings 10 years out, 15 years out, to have a hearing and still and test the waters uh, to determine whether or not that is still an, an accurate observation of the world we live in? Certainly, Your Honor, there's still deference given to the judicial branch, and the district court could, um, over the passage of time, determine that circumstances had changed. However, that is not the case here. We still have findings of fact on the record. Does that matter? We're not, does stare decisis apply to find prior fact references that we made in cases? Well, certainly with respect to the district court. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not, certainly. we gotta make our own decision. Yes. Right? We're yes. not bound by what we said in Crawford with respect to that so-called fact finding, correct? Well, Your Honor, um, in election cases, they are very fact specific. We do look at everything under the totality of yeah, we don't normally find circumstances facts, though, and, and local intent. We don't normally find the facts, Correct, though, correct? correct. And here, um, and so I shouldn't be bound by whatever comment someone has interpreted as a fact finding from a prior decision. Certainly, um, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 52A typically regards that a lower court finding of fact is, is left unless there is clear error. Mm -hmm. Okay, so under that circumstance, we should defer to the district court's fact finding here on a full record after time has long since elapsed since we made that fact finding. Unless you determine that that is no longer the case, um, that in the current circumstances, there would be a higher preponderance of evidence that it's not reasonable anymore. So you disagree with the approach taken by the Seventh Circuit? With respect to, Your Honor? The legislative fact and the district court's ability to make findings. The district court, have, I, I would agree that the district court does have the ability to make findings of Thank fact. you, counsel. Yes. So, um, Your Honors, here the court should uphold the ruling of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals um, in finding that Wisconsin's Act 23 is not a violative of the Constitution with respect to the 14th Amendment and also does not violate Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Petitioner is absolutely right that voting is, is fundamental and preservative of, of their rights. And it is precisely for these reasons that we do have acts like Act 23 and other regulations in 32 of the 50 United States um, prescribing the IDs that must be, must be shown to um, exercise yeah, your right to You're one to of vote. the most strict states. This is one of the most strict laws out there. Am I correct in that regard? According to the dissent in, in the second Frank case. Well, do you case, disagree? I mean, you're telling me you know about all these other state laws. Do you disagree that you're more strict? We, we may be regarded as one of the stricter states. You agree um, that you're one of the stricter states? We may be, yes, Your Honor. May or are, yes or no? Uh, according to that dissent, uh, we are I'm considered. I'm asking you as a representative of the state. Certainly to show a photo ID can be considered more restrictive it's than not, an ID, so It's not just show, showing so. a photo ID, it's that uh, unlike Crawford, uh, you don't have any out for people who can't get an ID. In Crawford, people who couldn't get an ID could still vote, uh, make a provisional vote and then just do an affidavit of identity. Sir, um, you don't. You say you've got three days, which will not include a weekend after the election, mm -hmm. to get down there and have that ID that you didn't have on Tuesday. Correct, Your Honor. However, we are more accommodating in other ways than Crawford. Although we only allow three days um, during that same week, uh, Crawford was more restrictive in, in other ways. We allow nine forms of identification. We do have similar exemptions regarding um, voters who are infirm or under a witness protection program. What do you do for people who can't get an ID because they can't, not that they won't try, but they mm -hmm. can't get a birth certificate? What do you do for those folks? Certainly, Your Honor. Um, we have a petition, which is a petition in name. It is really a form that may be submitted at any of the 92 service centers mm -hmm. in the state of Wisconsin providing information regarding why they do not have the documents mm -hmm. necessary otherwise mm -hmm. 
to receive a free voter ID. Mm -hmm. And after um, receipt of that petition, the administrator of that service center will review it and within two days decide whether or not a voter ID may be Under what given. standards? There, there is a level of discretion, Your Honor. However, this is in... Under what standards? I'm sorry? Are there any standards that guide it? Th the standards, are, I think, are still being worked out. This is... Act 23 has been contentious. So Would that be... Con and if, if we just said, if you want to engage in free speech in this country, in speech mm -hmm. in this country, yes. you have to submit an application to the same local person uh, who will then have discretion, and we'll get to the standards later. Would we tolerate that for a second under the First Amendment? I don't believe we would, but that, that's a different story. The First right, Amendment so is, is a federal right? right. I'm sorry? The First Amendment is a federal right, and here we are talking about um, voting, which is has been deemed to be a state um, issue in terms I'm of the sorry, regulation of that. I'm sorry, is it not a federal that. right? It, it is, Your Honor. If it's a federally protected right to vote. However, it is not absolute. So are you saying the state has an interest in the integrity of its elections? Absolutely, Your Honor, and this is a right that has been recognized time and time again. Um, not only in statutes such as the National um, Voter Registration Act and the Help America Votes Act, but also in, in cases of this court, including Crawford and, and Nixon. Can I just take you one step backwards? I think the question was, what happens when people can't get an ID? And I, and I heard you to be answering what it takes for them to get an ID. Right. So, so uh, now I'm confused. Are the 92 service centers that you're talking about polling places or DMV places? They are DMV places. So those are the places where we, I think the record shows that only one of them is open after 5 o'clock statewide? Yes, Your Honor. So how does that work? Well, um, this is no different in, in many ways than what someone has to do to vote. Uh, voting is a right. It is not absolute. It is still something that requires it's, it's, proactive measures. It's more measures. time off work, counsel, right? It's more time off work, and the person has to get there. It's another trip, right? Yes, Your Honor. It is another trip. However, under Act 23, it is only one trip. What if somebody shows up to the polls? Because I think this is a question that was asked earlier, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just not sure you answered it. What if someone shows up to the polls and is a registered voter and does not have an ID? then they may cast a provisional ballot and either return to that polling place before 4 p.m. with the appropriate ID or within three days to any of the service centers and s submit the information, either show their ID or submit the information and the documents to obtain a free voter ID. So if I did that and within three days I have to get, I have to take more time off work, right? I've taken time off work Correct. to go vote and now I have to ask my boss for more time off work to, within three days, same week, to get uh, uh, um, the, the, the identification at the one of the 92 service centers, is that right? Yes, um, however, this act has been in effect since 2011, and therefore um, this, there has been a period of time that, that persons can obtain this ID. And none of those service centers are open on Saturday, as I recall, is that right? Uh, we have one that is open on weekends, Your Honor, and two that are open after 5 p.m. Counsel, the question- The record says one open after 5 p.m., are you sure about that? Um, I believe it was, it was one and two, but um, certainly I, I will, I, I, I don't think that that's something that I'm, I'm going to quibble with you over at this time. What Thank if, you, Counsel, the questions that you're being asked about yes. the, the difficulty of having to try to get your ID if you don't have one, what, what is the standard by which we're trying, we should judge whether that's onerous or not? Is that even relevant? Or, or is that, if, if it is relevant, then what do we do with that information as an appellate court? Here? Certainly, Your Honor. I think we should return to the Anderson Burdick test. And under the Anderson Burdick test, we do first look to the level of the burden. But then we also must look at the um, level of the straight state interests. And here we have recognized legitimate state interests. What's your strongest state interest? You named four of them. What's your strongest? Um, Your Honor, I believe that certainly uh, the, the modernization of, of elections and having proper record keeping is, is very legitimate. Uh, protecting voter fraud is also something that is, is very legitimate and, and strong. Voter fraud is a tough argument for you since it's not even clear to me that it's perceptible. Well, Your Honor, we are, the state is allowed to take prophylactic measures under Monroe. Um, one brushes their teeth. They don't simply wait for the cavities to form and to have to get a filling or a root canal. Well, so is this it, is no different. Is the district court correct in saying that, the, that in, the, in the district court that the state did not contest that there really hasn't been any voter fraud? Isn't that established in this case? Yes, Your Honor, not in Wisconsin. However, um, in Indiana. Or, or, or anywhere. Well, there, there are national instances of, of voter fraud. This is one of the reasons that the HAVA um, instructs. And how much more likely is it to be struck by lightning? There's a, there's a, that, we have that quote somewhere in the record, Council. It's just almost <laughs> imperceptible, isn't it? There are certainly um, severe. This cannot be your strongest argument. Is that in the record, though? Your, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, is so a font, is it, is it in the record that it's the voter fraud is so rare as to be struck by lightning? Is that in the actual record of this case? Or is that in some of the things that are cited by people 
uh, as they write about this case. I believe, Your Honor, that it is not specifically in the record of this case. Didn't a member of our court include it in a dissent? Um, in Crawford. Isn't it Crawford? That would be in, in Crawford and, and not in this case. But Your I'm Honor. quibbling with you because I think the point is one that you're not really making. This is, it is uh, extremely unusual. Mm -hmm. Right, to, to have any instance of, of voter fraud. And my question is, what's your strongest state interest? And this is not it, surely. Okay, so um, then I, in terms of promoting trust in the electoral process, Your Honor, I think it's, we don't have to have one single strongest interest. Well, the, my question the, is, what do you think is your strongest interest, counsel? I, I think that the, that voter IDs promote orderly election keeping is something that no one can, can test, particularly after HAVA. What do you mean by How orderly? Does that work? Oh, go Forgive me for interrupting. What, what do you mean by that? that with a voter ID, with a specifically with a photo voter ID, um, it enforces the, re the registration mechanism. It ensures that those who show up to vote are those who that they say they are, that they are US citizens, that they reside in the place um, that's appropriate for that polling location, and that they reside in, in that state. How does and any of that happen because I show up with a voter ID as opposed to showing up with a voter registration card that has my name on it and I sign the polls, uh, you know, the, the register there? Certainly. Um, one of the elements recognized in the Carter Baker report is that th the U.S. has changed. We are no longer a nation of, of perhaps smaller towns where everybody knows each other. Um, and one of the precepts of, of voter fraud is that, you know, you can show up and, and no one will realize that you, you, are, you are not who you say you are. With a photo ID, that changes that. It commits a person to be the person that they purport to be on that ID. Okay, so but now you're talking about voter fraud again. And I, I heard you just say a minute ago that your strongest argument, you think your strongest state interest is promoting um, accuracy. accurate record keeping. How is that different than voter fraud? Are those I think, the same thing? I think they're very closely tied together, Your Honor. Where we have accurate records of the roles of registered voters in an area, then from there we can prevent voter fraud. Someone cannot just waltz into a polling area and cast a vote. So you, this is about voter fraud? It, I think that all three interests are very closely tied together, Your Honor. You Even if, go ahead, please. Even if 9% of the voters mm -hmm. are affected, is that, assume arguendo that it is, that's your worst case scenario. Yes. Um, is that significant enough to, to strike the law down facially? No, is Your Honor. Is that a large enough percentage? Uh, you know, some, some, some circuits use large fraction, that sort of thing. Is that a large enough percentage no, Your Honor, to strike this law down facially? No, Your Honor. Um, under the 14th Amendment, we, it, it is an equal protection clause. This is facially a neutral law. It is evenly applied to everyone. Even with respect to the Voting Rights Act, um, what we look for is, is not disparate um, outcomes, but disparate, uh, disparate effects. And but here- well, if it's evenly applied to people who have very different circumstances, yes. that, are we sure that that means it's even-handed in the terms that you're talking about? It is even-handed, Your Honor, um, in ways that are different than, for example, Chisholm. Chisholm v. Romer, that was a case where th the law was not facially neutral. That is, this That's law is worst, facially but, neutral. Right, but do we really have to just sort of pretend away the facts that we know, the impact that is obvious from a law? Your Honor, we, we do not contest the district fact findings regarding the impact um, to blacks and Latinos. However, under the second prong of the, the results test, the, the HUSTA test, I as I believe you referred it to it earlier, um, there must be a causal connection. And those social, that social and historical discrimination must be such that um, it is, is linked to the act itself, and that is not the case here. We have assertions from two professors regarding levels of um, employment and, and housing discrimination in, in Milwaukee, but we don't have facts regarding how much of that, if any, is from governmental action. And as um, we just discussed Wisconsin earlier. Wisconsin had a history of race discrimination? Th there are assertions, but this is not oh, easy oh, the habit. Really? I mean, has history, has Wisconsin, are you saying Wisconsin has no history of race discrimination? There, There is evidence of race discrimination in Wisconsin, but yeah. there is no evidence regarding the state of Wisconsin purporting race discrimination. I'm talking about historically. Historically, yes. Okay. When did that, when did you all stop discriminating completely as a state? <laughs> I don't believe that there was an ev any um, factual findings regarding the state discriminating. You represent the state. Surely, I bet you you've been sued for race discrimination by some of your employees in the last five years. That that is possible, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. so However, that you may is even be, have been found liable for race discrimination in a case. By perhaps, employees. Your Honor, but that that is not what we look for under a VRA claim. This is not vis v Abbott. This is not a situation where the state enacted laws that specifically divided one group of minorities versus another. We have not um, redrawn 
uh, districts, we have, have not well, have those types you, of instances. What if you said, we're going to change, everybody's got tight budgets. Okay. We're going to change the voting times 10 to 12, 2 to 5 all across the state. Those are the only times for voting. Would that be, would we would be able to look at the impact that has on people who work for a living, people who can't get off from their jobs for a living? Would we be able to look at that or would we just have to go, well, it applies evenly to everybody? Um, if that if that came if that happened and, and, and if that came to it, then I think we would be able to look at those things, but that's not the case here, Your Honor. Why what's the difference? The difference here is that um, the hours for obtaining a voter ID are, are not that different than, are really not no, but different. It's, it's not discriminatory. It applies evenly to everybody under the exact same test that you just articulated. Yes, Your Honor. I, I guess I'm just cautious about speaking too much about something that one has not happened and, and well, I'm trying to figure out what's going to come next. If we adopt your, the rule that you want, what's going to come next? Um, and how will we, if we say in this case, as long as it applies even handedly, you're good to go, then we're going to have to be ready to accept that. Well, I think, we? Your Honor, we could also take the converse and say that um, if we were to make um, illegal any law that applies to people of different socioeconomic stations differently, then that would actually lead to um, a lot of laws, almost all of them, um, perhaps being found illegal. Well, how about we only do it for the ones where you only have the most fleeting of interests asserted, when you assert an interest that has never actually an interest voter fraud that has never actually materialized in the history of Wisconsin, and then you also assert administrative interests which are never counting for much of anything in constitutional analysis. How about if we just do it in those cases? Well, Your Honor, in, in Crawford, certainly, um, although there was zero evidence of voter fraud in, in Crawford, that was those state interests were still found to be legitimate and the law upheld. And in that aspect, but that we was are 1%. not that different from Crawford. You said nine percent's not enough. What would be? What percentage would be enough to make us? no longer comfortable with the so-called even-handed application? Your Honor, I don't believe it comes down specifically to numbers, um, and therefore I'm hesitant to talk specifically well, about uh, numbers. Well, would 50%? Um, would you have the same position if it were 50%? Again, Your Honor, I believe that we would have to apply the Anderson Burdick weighing test. And in that case, more likely than not, we would be closer to a finding of unconstitutionality, but we're not quite there yet. Counsel, I'd just like to revisit this notion that there wasn't a finding of discrimination in Wisconsin. Uh, and just looking back at the uh, district court's decision here, and it sounds like there's a finding. He said one of his experts testified that in Wisconsin he found the sharpest, most pervasive, most persistent, most entrenched racial and social ethnic, socioeconomic disparities of virtually any region of the country. So there, there was a finding. Of yes, Your Honor. Discrimination in Wisconsin. That's I'm not, not saying that. I'm, I guess I should clarify. I'm not saying that there's not, there was not a finding that racism or discrimination exists in Wisconsin, merely that we do not have a finding that the state was responsible for that. And under Milliken, the state is not responsible for resolving those problems that they did not themselves cause. Right, so what you're asking us to assume is that this could go on, the most pervasive of any place in the country, according to this expert, and the state wasn't responsible. Is that right? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I think we can only conclude that based on the evidence that we have. We can't make a conclusion to, that they were specifically responsible. Now, the this Court is of Appeals uses some kind of survey at one point uh, in their extra record uh, analysis that says that more people who are minorities vote whenever you have voter ID uh, restrictions mm -hmm. than not. And, and I think the Court of Appeals is poking fun at the survey at some point or something. Um, but what it, it, should we take that in consideration, the fact that more people could vote um, because, of, because of the voter ID laws? Or should we ignore these studies altogether? What should, how should this court be looking at all of these things? I think certainly, Your Honor, that the studies should be taken into account. Um, there you is, do? There, there is Every single one of these studies? Studies, studies. The, if we can go and just research on our computers all we want and find studies that say whatever and, and use them? If they were done at the district court, Your Honor. Um, in, in terms of those types of studies, they, they, there are studies that show that voter confidence goes up when you have voter ID laws, and this is one of the reasons that okay, voter ID laws. I was talking laws. about studies that are referred to in the Court of Appeals, not in the district court record. Okay. Should we use those? If, if they are part of the record, Your Honor, I think that that's Are they that part of the record? I'm asking you. 
are, are studies that are in the Court of Appeals cited by the Court of Appeals, are those part of this record? I believe, Your Honor, that the, the factual findings should remain with those that were found at the district court level. I think the Supreme Court's been known to look at studies now and then that aren't in the record below. Have we been wrong all the times we've done that? Um, may I answer the question, Your Honor? Sure, and aren't, haven't you been, haven't we been wrong? Because even in the Brandeis <laughs> brief itself, there are factual errors. And so maybe we shouldn't be relying on all these amicus and random studies, and we should actually get a real record. And maybe we need to remedy that as a court. <laughs> Uh, Your Honors, I, I certainly <laughs> would not presume to tell the Supreme Court what you should and shouldn't do. Um, and certainly the Brandeis briefs have, have been more popular in recent years and, and have a place along with the, the Mika brief. Um, I believe that what they're trying to do is, is talk about the effects of the law. Um, effects of the law notwithstanding, um, the law is what it is. And the precedent of this case, of the court, this court is what it is. And under the Anderson verdict test, under the results test um, with respect to the Voting Rights Act, Section 2, Act 23 is constitutional and does not violate those. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Your honors, Act 23 is a solution looking for a problem. And I think that was made evident by the, the uh, justifications that have been put forth by the state. You don't have to have a problem before the legislature acts for a solution, do you? Can a legislation be prophylactic? In, under the Anderson verdict analysis, they cannot be unless the measures that they're taking to stop are actually weighty enough to outweigh the burden. And here, there's So been you're no saying in election integrity and in the abstract is not a weighty enough interest to allow you to act prophylactically? Without any evidence of it ever occurring, no, Your Honor, it is not. And the reason that this case Aren't is distinct. Are you trying to have your cake and eat it too? Because for the state, you say no, no, no. You have to have actual evidence. But when it comes to uh, your side of the story, um, we have folks who uh, you, you came up with eight people, and but you, you didn't really come forward with a ton, any evidence showing that in the inter intervening election in 2012 that there had been any impact on voting. And you just grabbed eight people out of the entire state to say that they had some trouble getting. Uh, an ID, but we don't really know if they're the only eight. So you don't want to have to put on the hard evidence, but you want to demand it of them. Is well, that I, fair? I believe that the petitioners have put on much more evidence than the other side if you look at it from that perspective. But the you haven't on the impact of this <coughs> law on actual voter turnout, which is the heart of your case. Well, the eight individuals who testified are on the impact of that law, and that is infinitely more than the state has put forward to the Voting, voter fraud justification. Because but, but you don't have any evidence that the 9% of the people, that they had a less turnout in your state than, um, than you would have had. There's no evidence of the turnout on the record, but there is evidence that can be used to see how that turnout would be affected. We have 300,000 people, 80% of which are low education level, and up to two-thirds of them are in poverty, meaning they make less than $20,000 a year. And the impact of that on getting an ID is plain to see, especially when you take the individual stories given by these people who testified at trial, that they're not, they're not outlandish stories. They're very common problems that could affect lots of people. How do we distinguish Crawford, or do you think we just have to overrule it? Crawford absolutely does not need to be overruled. It's distinguishable on a lot of levels. For one, finding- How would you like us to distinguish it? I'd like you to distinguish Crawford, especially in the interest of voter fraud, because there, these cases are markedly different. For one, Crawford did not have instances of voter fraud, as was brought up, but they did have two important things which Justice Stevens relied on in his opinion. One, they had 41% voter, voter inflation rolls. Their rolls were inflated to 41%, 1.3 million people, which makes, the, which makes the idea that they're susceptible to voter fraud much more reasonable because it makes someone finding someone that they know will never vote because they're either deceased or out of the state, that's more reasonable when you know that 41% of the people aren't going to show up. That's not evident here to any extent, let alone 41%. And secondly- What percent is it? It's not on the record at all. Nothing was put forward by the state. I imagine if it was, if the rules were inflated, that would have been put forward. Secondly, they, the Stevens opinion also relied heavily on the fact that East Chicago, which is in Indiana, had experienced heavy voter fraud in 2013. Not in-person voter fraud, but absentee ballot. A whole big ordeal that affected the mayoral race for that city, and they stated that that gave Indiana, because it took place within their borders, reason to believe that voter fraud was a problem and they could step forward. No, again, nothing analogous has been put forward by the state in this case. So the, finding it 
finding voter fraud pr uh, prevention as a justifiable interest in Crawford is, uh, is you're capable of doing that while also stating that it's not here because there's no evidence of any kind to support it. What's the rule to go forward? The rule would be if there's evidence to lead, some, lead someone to believe that there could be voter fraud occurring. Here we have no instances, we have no evidence that, would, that the state has put forward of anything saying this is why we think voter fraud is occurring. It's simply- Is there any case where we've stuck it down a law as facially unconstitutional on the basis you just said that if there's a chance something unconstitutional could happen? Well, on the basis that it could, that voter fraud could happen? No, no, on the basis that, that voters, because you don't have the evidence of um, uh, actual impact on vote. So have well, we again, we do have down? eight individuals which are an impact. Mm -hmm. that, that's an impact in and of itself. That's and not a facial, though. You were asked about that's that identical. earlier. Mm -hmm. I, I can't point to a specific case where that has happened, but if you're running the Anderson verdict analysis, which is what those what this court has done in the past, the weight, the interest that have been put forward, the burden on the individuals is much more weighty than any interest that the states have put okay. forward. Just to be clear, so you, you're not arguing for strict scrutiny, that we should just do the Anderson balancing? Correct, the Anderson balancing. However, if, this, if the burden is found to be severe, then an analogous test to strict scrutiny applies where the state interests are supposed to be compelling and the law narrowly tailored. However, as it's a sliding scale, so anything less than that, the relationship needs to be less strict and, and less weighty. Act 23 turns democracy on its head, and it turns government by consent of the governed to a government that allows people to consent based on photo IDs. It's unconstitutional and should be uh, overruled. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council. we should deliberate at this time. <laughs> so we will retire to deliberate, but first can we give the students a hand? Mm -hmm. All right, so while we wait for the judges to deliberate, uh, we're gonna make a presentation of awards. Uh, but before we get to that, I actually wanna take some time uh, to thank some individuals uh, without whose help uh, now this would be possible. Um, I know the dean already did this, but I wanna thank our sponsors again, Jones Day and Experian. I believe this is their sixth time sponsoring us, and as always, we're very helpful for the support. Um, we definitely wouldn't be at the level we would be without them. Uh, I also want to, name some individuals in particular. I want to thank Cassandra Flores, our events coordinator. Uh, it's, her <laughs> it's her first year here, but you wouldn't know it. Um, she's just been so helpful. Uh, you know, today is one event, but in fact, this program takes place over an entire year. And in between, there's a lot of rooms to be reserved. There's a lot of planning to be done. And she's been with us every step of the way. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Mr. Stuart Miller, uh, who went, Above and beyond what an attorney volunteer needs to do, uh, he helped us in the beginning with uh, revamping our score sheets, and he's been in several of our oral arguments. I think at one point he was here three nights in a row, and I have no idea how where he found the time, but we're eternally grateful. Um, I also want to thank Professor Rick Hassan. Um, he's our resident election law expert, and given the problem, um, we're very grateful that he spent so much time uh, helping us with his input and making the bench brief the best it could be. Um, and of course, I, I, I'm going to name some people, so we'll hold the applause to the, to the end. Um, professors uh, Chilby Robinson Dorn and Paul Hoffman for the brief uh, writing training and the oral argument training. Um, as always, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky and Professor Rachel Krosky Roberts, who are always our um, faculty advisors and whose institutional knowledge. Um, ensures that we don't have to completely relearn everything uh, from scratch. And then finally, uh, my fellow board members, um, with whose, without whose help, um, well, we couldn't have done this thing. And in particular, uh, Elizabeth Tussaud, who somehow managed to get judges for every single oral argument round, uh, Lee Dickey uh, for organizing the internal competition, our bench brief committee, who sacrificed their summer to write the bench brief and research all the issues. Um, and I guess, I could keep going, but I should stop. 
Um, we had over 60 attorneys, judges, and justices uh, participate in this program, um, giving up their nights to judge our students. Um, we had 19 professors grade our briefs, as well as 19 1Ls giving up their time as bailiffs. And for all those who I named and didn't name, um, would you please give them all a hand? Um, oh, and I also forgot uh, Senator Joe Dunn for getting all their practice round judges. I knew I left out somebody. So. And now for the best brief awards. So I get the incredible honor of um, providing the awards to uh, both runner-up best brief and best brief in the 2016 competition. Um, so what I'm going to ask those winners to do, what I call them, is to come up to accept your award. I'm imagining that our photographer probably wants a few photos. Um, so um, I will announce first the runner-up best brief and let them come up and then I will announce the winners. So our two runner-ups for best brief are Ariella Rutkin Becker and Emil Ayub. Congratulations. And this year's winners for best brief go to Sarah Banco and Remick Stahl. You may not have any idea if you have not competed before just how onerous drafting a brief for this competition was, but if you aren't impressed by these people, talk with them about how much time this took them. This is an amazing accomplishment for all involved. Congratulations. Well, we've come to the time in the program where we are going to announce the winner of the competition, of the, of the oral advocacy portion of the competition. And this was a very difficult decision. The, the, the advocates that we were able to see here today would, would be splendid advocates in any of our courts. They're, they were well prepared. They knew the facts of their case. They knew, um, they knew the case law. They were respectful and polite and had all of the proper etiquette. They weren't just reading speeches from their notes. They had spent a lot of time crafting arguments, but also they showed a great deal of um, skill in listening and responding. And, the, and many seasoned uh, people who argue before our courts don't listen. <laughs> and so I, I want to make sure that you know 
that you have the skill set necessary to do this if this is something you choose to do. And I hope that we get bright young lawyers like yourselves arguing before our courts. It enriches our courts in that way. So congratulations to those of you who did the problem. It was a sophisticated problem, a very topical problem. Um, and, and you did a very nice job, all of you who are involved in this competition. Now, I need to tell you something about myself. When I was a third year student in law school, I was in my moot court competition. And I lost. <laughs> and it was devastating at the time. But one day... It looks like it worked out okay, though. Well, I was <laughs> going to say... I was going to say that um, it was a two-to-one split decision because they told us that at my law school. And the one judge who voted for us was a judge named Patrick Higginbotham. And I've had the great pleasure and honor of succeeding Patrick Higginbotham on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. So I knew I liked him back then, and I still <laughs> like him today. Without further ado, uh, they're doing very well, too. We're, we're happy for them. No. <laughs> so the goal is to lose this competition. No, 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 no. Nonsense. But, but I just want you to know that you're, you're both winners, and that's not meant as a cliche. That's, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. So you're both winners. But today, the, um, the best advocate was the petitioner, Mr. Brett Law. Thank you. My very distinguished colleagues, and, and may I say as a point of personal privilege, my very delightful colleagues <laughs> are going to give you some comments. Would you like to go first? Um, sure, I'll start. So um, I just want to echo, first of all, uh, what Judge Eldrod said. This was fantastic oral arguments by both of you, and it's very unfair. I will register an objection with Dean Chemerinsky that we had to choose between the two of you. Um, you are both most welcome at any time in the D.C. Circuit to come and argue and train a lot of the people who actually do the arguments now. <laughs> so they should all follow in your shoes. Um, uh, Mr. Long, you were, first of all, you did one of the hardest things that was, and I, I changed the rules on you the second you got up and made you switch, and you did it. And if you're in the audience, that's hard. Doing these arguments is very hard. I used to do a lot of them. It is nerve-wracking. Your life is on hold. There's life before oral argument and life after oral argument. Um, and things keep getting pushed into that after oral argument uh, box. Um, it's nerve-wracking. You have to know so much, and you have to be ready for anything that comes. And you were ready for getting sideswiped as soon as you got up here and you adjusted. It's a hard thing. I respect what, how hard it was. I understand how hard it was. I debated whether we should even do it. Um, but it's exactly what a court would do, and I think judges would do in a situation like this, and you handled that very smoothly. So I congratulate you on that. Um, you had an excellent uh, rebuttal. Uh, you had some really carefully thought lines. You wanted you want to leave a powerful image in our minds, um, and you handled questioning very well. Not, you both were actually incredibly knowledgeable of case law and the record. Um, Ms. Zhang, am I saying that correctly? Ms. Zhang. Um, you stood up to... <laughs> an absolute tidal wave of questioning. And that, and when we're, the way this bench is, we sometimes couldn't tell the other one was trying to talk. And so that is phenomenal. And that's hard, right? It's you're like, which question am I supposed to even answer right now? That, that's one of the reasons it's so hard to choose between the them. You were, that was phenomenal how you did that. You were unflappable. Um, and you kept going and you kept your story. You stuck to your guns. Um, and you kept having a dialogue with us. You could have gotten frustrated. Uh, maybe you did get frustrated. You could have shown <laughs> your frustration, but you didn't. Um, and so I congratulate you on that. And I said both of you have obviously worked hard knowing the case law and the record, and you used it to your advantage in making your arguments. So congratulations to you both. Well, I'll try not to repeat the comments, but, um, but I was very, very impressed. I was worried today. I'm always a little worried about moot court competitions because I know how hard you prepare, and I want to uh, make sure that I do my part. Dean Chemerinsky told me you would be well prepared, and I had to take this one really seriously, and he always keeps his promises, uh, mm -hmm. I have learned, and he, and he was right. Your hard work, both of you, 
you, you, you worked very, very hard, and that really, really showed, and it really paid off. I can tell you both that your first uh, oral arguments in real life will be easier than <laughs> this one, for sure. You, you, I, I just really echo the remarks that uh, you, you both held up very, very well um, to uh, a lot of questions. I was impressed that you had prepared, you of course came to the podiums with prepared notes, but were quick to deviate from, from them. I thought you were stellar, both of you, at listening to our questions. And we just spend our lives saying, please answer my question, please answer my question, because lawyers are you know, understandably nervous and terrible about listening to our questions and answering them. You both appear genuinely engaged with us and having a dialogue, having a conversation, which is what we just pray for the night before oral arguments. And you did that um, just, just beautifully. I wanted to tell um, the respondent, I thought you were particularly well versed in the law and I was really impressed and appreciated by that, appreciated that very much. And the appellant I thought was terrific about knowing the record. It's a pretty dense record, pretty fact specific. And uh, you did uh, uh, remarkably well. So thank you so much. It's been a, a real pleasure. And I hope you stay in the ninth. <laughs> thank you very much. I want to conclude the program by extending my congratulations to two terrific advocates and also very much for thanking the three judges who came here today. Each of them traveled a long distance. Each took time from a very busy schedule. Each obviously was incredibly prepared. Each asked really hard, terrific questions. So please join me in thanking Judge Kristen, Judge Elrod, and Judge Millett.